Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining us uh, for a lively conversation about the pools and uh, the, the day after spring break. So thanks for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Dean, who will be giving uh, the, uh, the, the research presentation for today. Uh, Dr. Adam Dean is the department chair and associate professor of history, earned his PhD from the University of Virginia in 2010, specializes in 19th century US history with a focus on the environment. His book, An Agrarian Republic, Farming, Anti-Slavery Politics, and Nature Parks in the Civil War Era, came out in 2015 with the University of North Carolina Press. His other work includes an article on the establishment of Yosemite State Park and two pieces on history textbooks in the 20th century. Dr. Dean's current research interests are in comparing wildlife policy in national parks in Finland and the United States, as well as illuminating the links between the two nations' environmental history. Dr. Dean's teaching experience includes experiential learning, the digital humanities, and classes in US history, environmental history, and slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Dean. Thank you all for coming today. And I'll go ahead and let a few people trickle in, sit down. Hopefully you're able to get some lunch beforehand. No, Tom's a little angry. <laughs> In 1878, a gray wolf attacked a nine-year-old girl and dragged her kicking and screaming into the woods near the city of Turku, Finland, which is in the southwestern part of the country. You can see it here on the map down here. This is a map from around the time in 1880. Two years later, so in 1880, a clear predation pattern became evident. One of the wolves sees the eight-year-old son of Taylor W. Hohenberry, again outside Turku, when the little boy was crossing a hedge. The father and other villagers only found pieces of his body parts. This death was shocking enough that it made newspaper coverage and caught the attention of the local governor. The wolves at first targeted individuals or groups of children walking at night in or near the forests outside of Turku. But the attacks became increasingly brazen. By the fourth attack, the wolves began targeting children close to homes and farms. In August 1881, wolves grabbed five-year-old Oscar Newmelin while he was with his mother. While there is no record of the woman's height or size, targeting a child with a larger adult showed that the wolves were no longer fearing bigger humans. On October 31, 1881, in one of the last attacks, one of the wolves literally grabbed a six-year-old girl, Alina Christina, from her front porch. Between 1878 and 1881, with the overwhelming majority of attacks occurring in 1880 and 1881, two or three wolves attacked and killed at least 22 children with some historians putting the death figure even higher in the low 30s, in the villages and forests outside of Turku. While this episode may seem more appropriate for a 1990s B-movie than a research talk, I will explain today why it is worthy of study. Historians of both Finland and the United States have written books and studied the relationship between gray wolves and, and humans. And in case you are not aware, these attacks are incredibly unusual in the entire story of wolves and their relationship with humans. A wolf wildlife biologist did a study of 150 years of U.S. history and found basically one wolf attack on a human. So it's incredibly unusual. 
even compared with other predators and other wildlife. But outside of a few global overviews of wolf attacks written by wildlife biologists, there has not been a comparative focus. This leads to my first contention. While journalists, wildlife biologists, and historians in Finland have blamed the highly unusual attacks for negative attitudes towards wolves in that nation, examining the story of wolves and humans in the United States challenges this view. There was nothing remotely similar in the U.S., and just like Finland, wolves were nearly eradicated from the country in the early 20th century. Second, U.S. historians have identified a turning point in the relationship between wolves and humans in the late 1800s, when wolf hunting went from the domain of amateurs and farmers to the realm of highly trained professionals, armed with modern chemical poisons and backed by increasingly powerful governments. The response to the predatory wolf behavior in Finland, I contend, illustrates this exact transition point. The efforts by amateurs to kill the wolves responsible failed, while the efforts of professional hunters brought in from elsewhere in the Russian Empire succeeded. Finland at the time was an autonomous region of Russia. Third, and if I may humbly say, the most groundbreaking and significant contention is that the attacks and the response to them are the products of global environmental changes happening in the late 1800s. What produced the highly unusual predation behavior was the expansion of human settlement into previously remote areas, the overhunting of moose, which was the preferred and is the preferred prey species of wolves in Finland. By the way, it's very confusing. Finns call wolves hirvi, and in Swedish, elk, and in popular thing, they call them elk. Elk in the United States is a completely different animal than moose. and the transformation of an ecosystem to meet the needs of domesticated livestock. These developments were products of colonial expansion and the Industrial Revolution. It is no coincidence that the first call for national parks in the Nordic countries happened during the attacks in 1880. The Finnish Swedish Arctic explorer Adolf Erik Nordenskjold proposed a Rieks Park, or a Nations Park, in response to the same changes connected to the attacks. Namely, that, quote, railways, telegraphs, sawmills, and workshops were being built far out in the wilderness, end quote. By the way, Nordenskjold's an interesting guy. He was born and raised in Finland and grew up speaking both Finnish and Swedish, but then he made a speech at his own college graduation, he was valedictorian, that was deemed too anti-Russian and politically liberal, so he got exiled to Sweden and never went back to his native Finland during his entire life. But my main point is that the growth in the power of the central government in Finland and the United States as well as scientifically informed bureaucracies enabled the near total destruction of the gray wolf population in both countries. But that these developments also led to the establishment of national parks in both Finland and the United States. So let's begin by exploring that first point. Anglo-American colonists in America and Finns long held a hatred towards wolves because of their predation behavior on valuable domestic animal property. So here's a very famous or infamous photo showing cowboys in Wyoming 
torturing a gray wolf. This is a fact, of course, that's long been known in environmental history. The very first hunting bounties in Finland were for the brown bear and the wolf, which the Swedish monarchy, Finland had been part of Sweden before it was part of Russia, introduced in 1647. Local towns and districts paid out bounties for people to go out and kill wolves and bears. Just two years prior, in 1645, English colonists in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, after complaining of, quote, great loss and damage because wolves were devouring, quote, great numbers of our cattle, end quote, introduced bounties. And this was very real. According to Finnish census data, carnivores, including wolves, killed 135,000 cattle, sheep, pigs, and horses, the last of which were by far the most valuable, between 1865 and 1885. Now, there was actually a difference in hunting methods in both countries. So in the United States, the preferred hunting method was tracking or digging a pit for a wolf. And due to heavy snowfall throughout Finland, and particularly in northern Finland, in what is today called Sopmi, previously called Lapland, locals killed wolves by literally skiing them to exhaustion, so they would follow them on skis until the wolves became exhausted. Both societies were also Protestant and Christian. As Barry Lopez notes in his seminal book of Wolves and Men, the Christian beliefs that characterized much of Finnish and American religious history emphasized that, quote, man demonstrated his own prodigious strength as well as his allegiance to God by killing wolves, end quote. In Finland, by law, clergy in the Lutheran church had to read hunting laws and bounties from the pulpit before they began religious services. And both societies from the 1600s through the 20th century pursued wolves with a special sort of viciousness, baiting with them with dogs and torturing them to death. The professional hunters responsible for finally bringing down the two wolves responsible for killing the children talked about this behavior, speculating that the wolves engaged in this practice in retaliation for the rampant killing of wolf pups in the area. So they noted that farmer Kapupera, who lived in what was then Yalan, Finland, which is today Pudita, those compound Finnish words that's hard to pronounce, had killed 56 wolf pups alone in the years that the children were killed. So that's one way people at the time interpreted the predation behavior, was that people had been killing wolf pups and these two wolves were having their revenge, which has no scientific basis whatsoever. <laughs> but that does show the attitude towards wolves at the time and the common hunting practices. Folklore and ideology were intertwined with the religious hatred of wolves. The first novel written in the Finnish language, which is Seven Brothers by Alexis Kivi in 1870, displays the wolf hatred common in Finnish folklore in the time period. By the way, it's written in archaic Finnish, and so there are two English translations of it, both of which were actually wildly different from each other. But regardless of what translation you take, wolf hatred is a common theme. So there's this key moment in the book, the seven <coughs> brothers don't want to get real jobs, so they go retreat into the woods, building a sauna in the woods. Sauna is the only word from the Finnish language that's in English, that's made it into the English language. Anyway, their sauna burns down, seven dudes are naked in the woods, and so they start talking. One of the brothers, Yuhani, says, quote, a naked man, so I've heard, 
is a tasty roast for a wolf. Timo, his other brother, responds, quote, I, and I've heard that a man and a pig taste the same, and we suspect a pig's a wolf's a favorite food. Wolves are thus both a threat to humans and to their livestock. At the end of the book, Iro, the youngest of the seven brothers who each achieve met some respectability, becomes a game warden and is responsible for organizing hunts that, quote, drove many a wolf, many a lynx, and bear into a carefully constructed ambush, end quote. Now, there's similar literary themes and attitudes towards wolves in the United States. This here is George Catlin, who was and is a world-famous Western artist. But he's also famous for being the first American to call for the creation of what he called a nation's park. And his 1841 book, where he calls for the creation of a nation park, was in Norden Scholl's library. So he helped inspire this Finnish Swedish Arctic explorer. And wolves are a big theme. So he physically was in the American West during a temporary explosion of the wolf population tied to commercial bison hunting. So people would shoot bison and then just take their fur and cut out their tongues, leaving the carcass to rot on the prairie. That was a huge boon for wolves. So people talked about massive increase in the wolf population, big packs of up to 50 animals roaming the Great Plains and the Rockies. And Catlin's writings indicate a particular disdain for wolves. So Catlin really liked the American bison. He was quite prescient in thinking that they would go extinct due to commercial bison hunting. That's why he calls for a national park. But when writing about and drawing wolves attacking bison, he wrote quite negatively of them saying that, quote, wolves had an insatiable veracity and that he wished he could help the bison being attacked by them. And Catlin worried that with the extinction of the bison, some 1.5 million wolves, that number was probably exaggerated, not probably was, would, quote, now seek for the means of substance along our exposed frontier predicting wolves would turn to attack humans now that their prey, the bison, was gone. Using a common linkage dating to the colonial era, Catlin thought that wolves and Native Americans, once the bison would gone, would unite to threaten American colonists on the frontier. Indeed, the fact that indigenous nations in the United States seem to live alongside wolves without slaughtering them proved their lack of civilization in the eyes of many Anglo-Americans. And this seemed threatening, right? To use one quote, Frank Gror, who was the son of an LDS or Mormon missionary and a Polynesian woman, later became the adopted brother of Sitting Bull, beside, and then fought for the U.S. Army, <coughs> described the Lakota war cries at the Battle of the Rosebud in 1876 as having a, quote, wolfish bark to them because the Indians for untold ages have been imitators of the vocal characteristics of the wolf. Now, the growth of sport hunting and fishing organizations in the 19th century in both the United States and Finland did lead to some protection for game animals and fish species, like the bison, elk, moose, deer, and trout. But they specifically excluded wolves and other predators. Timo Burrosalo and Marie Poya Murka 
surveyed Swoman mensas tuslati, which translates somewhat awkwardly as Finnish hunting magazine. So they surveyed all the articles published between 1906 and 1929 and found anti-predator views extensively included in all types of articles and advertisements. While some Finns in the early 20th century suggested preserving brown bears, lynx, and foxes as quote-unquote natural relics of the past, the toll wolves took on livestock was just too high for anyone to speak for their conservation. Similarly, in the United States, while elite sport hunting groups like the Boone and Crockett Club, which boasted President Theodore Roosevelt as one of their members, and also another influential guy named George Berg Grinnell, tied with the establishment of Glacier National Park, now, these guys did not like this at all. So they passed resolutions saying you shouldn't torture even hated predators. But they totally supported their eradication. They just thought it should be done humanely. And they thought that getting rid of wolves and other predators would lead to an increase in game species like elk that they wanted to hunt and shoot. Now, there were some contrary voices, both in Finland and the United States. And I recently connected with a Finnish scholar named Hetta Ladesmaki. She wrote her entire dissertation on people refusing to participate in wolf hunts in Finland in the 19th century. And there was dissent in the United States from people who spent close contact with, who had close contact with wolves in the wild, and also religious descent. So Osborne Russell, a trapper who traveled the Rocky Mountains between 1834 and 1843, including what became Yellowstone National Park. Maggie, you may remember I assigned this as a reading. Wrote of great wolves, quote, they are not ferocious toward man, and will run at the sight of him. Then there was religious dissent. As historian John Coleman notes, Joseph Smith, founding prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, instructed his followers, quote, not to kill any animals or birds or anything created by Almighty God that had life, just for the sake of destroying it, end quote. After Smith's own death at the hands of an anti-Mormon mob in Carthage, Illinois, the LDS faithful trekked across the Great Plains on a long journey to Utah, which was then part of Mexico. On a Sunday during the trip, during an outdoor sacrament meeting, which is an LDS religious gathering on a Sunday, a wolf showed up. So this was like an outside religious gathering. A gray wolf shows up. Some people want to instantly shoot it, but the guy giving the sermon, LDS Apostle George Smith, admonished the people to follow Smith's guidance and leave the wolf alone. But this insistence on following Joseph Smith's teachings did not prevent cattle herders in the exact same wagon frame from killing wolf pups when they came across a den. And when they arrived in Salt Lake City, powerful men within the LDS church, including, <clears throat> I thought I had included a picture of him, but I guess I did it, so we're going to move right ahead. <laughs> Including John D. Lee, later executed for his role in the Mountain Meadows Massacre, organized large predator hunts. So in two months in 1849, Lee and his men killed 84 wolves, 65 foxes, and hundreds of other predators in and around the Salt Lake Valley. 
1850, the General Assembly in what was then called the State of Deseret announced a bounty of $3 for each large mountain wolf. It's referring to great wolves. Payments on wolf bounties accounted for 15% of the territory's budget that year. Now that's not actually unusual, but the point I'm trying to make is that economic interest, ideology, and folklore overcame the initial religious dissent from the dominant ideas of the day. Thus, negative attitudes to wolves in both countries were well established when the attacks in Finland started. To protect themselves from the wolves, villagers throughout the wooded areas near Turku erected tall fences around their cottages to protect the kids. They also responded using the pre-industrial methods long employed in Finland and the United States. So one municipality raised the wolf bounty and arranged for three community wolf hunts. That's basically passing out guns, saying everyone now go into the woods and shoot wolves. According to this guy, Uno Goldenhelm, who was a Finnish government official at the time, and then published a collection of primary sources related to the wolf attacks. This is actually the first, by the way, historical take on them. Wrote that no wolves were harmed in any of these hunts. <laughs> After the failure of the community hunts in Turku, Finns on the city council appointed a so-called wolf committee tasked with releasing poisoned carcasses, a relatively new method, distributing rifles and ammunition among expert marksmen, and recruiting experienced wolf hunters from Karelia, which was then part of Finland. Finland actually lost it after World War II, but at the time it was part. So one of the hunters recruited was A. Hintz, this guy, the wonderful 19th century beer. And he kept a diary of his efforts to kill the wolves responsible for eating the children. Searching the woods in November and December in 1880, in the cold and dark Finnish winter on skis, the efforts of the so-called experienced wolf hunters came to vain. Hence, in particular, complained about companions getting drunk, and wanting to dance with women in the city of Turku rather than actually hunt wolves. In another episode, they tried to create a cordon approach, so Hintz actually thought they had identified the two wolves responsible. They saw them trying, you know, hanging out around a well-known path that children took to school. They thought, these are the two wolves responsible. Let's get a cordon together. Some of the guys drank too heavily, and let the wolves escape. And on December 19, 1880, they left Turku after 43 days of hunting without getting the wolves responsible. As the attacks continued in 1881, Finns were getting desperate. Now, there had actually been some success. According to the Finnish census, 35 wolves were actually killed in the parishes around Turku, but not the two responsible. And in that census data, it actually doesn't distinguish between wolf cubs and adult wolves. The Finnish language does. Susi is Finnish for wolf. Peruna is Finnish for wolf cub. But the consensus in the literature is most of those wolves were probably cubs, not adult wolves. And there was widespread outrage in the Finnish media. They blamed one of the wolf hunters, Ignati Warninen, for never even attempting to shoot a wolf. 
Others claimed that equivalent bounties on links were giving the wrong sort of incentive. Now, it's actually interesting because according to Finnish historian Yoko Tepperi and the Finnish national census, government officials had not ruled out the possibility that it was not actually wolves, but European lynx that were eating the kids. So it wasn't until early 1881 that state officials determined that lynx were indeed excuse me, that wolves were indeed responsible for the kids' deaths. That's why the bounty had been similar for so long. One writer in a Toroku newspaper urged that the military get involved. But another countered that, quote, the soldiers were not accustomed to the obedience and discipline necessary for such a cunning pair of wolves. Now, I actually think that could be read as a veiled swipe at the Russian military, which is a long-held tradition in Finland. And the Russians were talking about kind of taking over the Finnish autonomous military. Finally, a government committee in Helsinki on October 6, 1881, determined that a team of the best wolf hunters from Russia, Poland, and Lithuania get involved with a Finnish military force of 100 men at their command. They also promised rewards of 500 marks, a big sum in that day, for full-grown wolves in the Turku area. So this guy, Major Turing, a Finn from Oulu, was tasked with leading the effort. Turing selected a group of 24, and they left Turku on December 10, 1881, to hunt wolves. They were actually worried it wouldn't be successful because their plan was to actually hunt the wolves on skis. But there wasn't a lot of snow. It was an unusually warm winter. But on January 2nd, 1882, the team identified two wolves with unusually big tracks and concluded that they were the animals dangerous to children. A lieutenant named Ivan Palkia, which is a Russian name, shot the female wolf, and they found that she was, quote, an unusually old animal with worn teeth and dirty yellow fur. A Captain Tarasevich shot her male companion, but he escaped, only to die 12 days later by the ingestion of poison from a poison-laced carcass, a more modern method. Their gamble that these were the two wolves responsible was indeed correct. The attacks immediately stopped. In Lytala, Finland, villagers greeted the hunters with, quote, the most delightful congratulations, and Tulin sent the male wolf to be stuffed in Turku and exhibited in the Finnish Senate where it still remains in the Finnish National Archives. There's actually some debate about the provenance of this stuffed wolf. Some people say, well, we don't actually know if it was one of, if it was related to this episode. Other people say, yeah, it was the wolf that was shot and killed and stuffed. They skinned the other and sent it to a government official. Now, professional wolf hunters, mostly using poisoned-laced carcasses, and then teams of skilled hunters for more crafty animals, decimated the wolves of Finland in the years between 1875 and 1915. In the five-year period between 1881 and 1885, according to the Finnish census, which is Translate, they decided to translate into French for some reason. You can see the difference between those two languages. They're nothing alike. A total of 572 wolves were killed. Now get this. 192 wolves were killed in 1881. So this is 1881. Susia is plural for wolves. In 
and then 128 in 1882 across the entire country, with the two responsible for killing the kids coming at the end of the region. So they literally killed hundreds of wolves before actually getting the two that killed the children. Uno Godenhelm credited the skill of the hunters and poisoned carcasses for successfully killing the child-eating animals as well as their non-child-eating brethren in southern Finland. By 1915, the wolf population reached its lowest point in Finnish history. The episode reflects a similar development in the United States. While communities across time and space, from New Haven, Connecticut to Salt Lake City, Utah, organized amateur wolf hunts, went after dens, destroyed wolf habitat, and dug traps, such efforts could not actually kill all wolves. Much like Hintz's disdain for the drunkenness and incompetence of his compatriots in Turku, Finland, the professionals employed by the federal government in the United States did not favor wolf bounties, amateur wolf hunts, or bungling. In 1915, Congress created the Predatory Animal and Rodent Control Service, and the hunters that the service employed were not violent men like John D. Lee, capable of killing wolves and people, or farmers like Kakupera, who killed 56 wolf cubs, but wildlife biologists with college degrees from places like Yale. Using mostly strychnine, a relatively new poison, which people also experimented as a performance-enhancing drug at the time. In 1904, the guy who won the Olympic marathon tried to dope with strychnine. But also, <coughs> traps and guns were particularly tricky animals. These men oversaw the eradication of wolves in the United States with just a few packs escaping the slaughter in northern Minnesota and Michigan. In 1926, professional hunters employed by the National Park Service killed the last wolf in Yellowstone. Thus, the response to the attacks shows the transition from wolf hunting being the domain of amateurs and farmers to the realm of highly trained and educated professionals armed with strike knife. Yet, the reasons behind the attacks show the unique impact of human beings on the environment at the start of the Anthropocene, the unofficial unit of geological time that designates when human activity started to dominate the Earth's climate and ecosystems. Usually, and in contrast to other predators even, wolves do not attack people because they are not habituated. They are terrified of humans. This is what fur trader Osborne Russell found out. But in 1870s and 1880s Finland, there was rapid development in Finland's forests. Adolf Erik Nordenschultz's own brother-in-law started a paper mill in the backwoods area outside of Turku in southeast Finland. Excuse me, not in Turku, southeast Finland. And while one Swedish historian has suggested something of a conspiracy theory that these two notorious wolves that ate all the kids became habituated because they were captured, became tame, and then released, I find scavenging behavior a far more probable explanation. An important study on gray wolves conducted in 2019 in western Iran, of all places, found that when human activity depletes the native prey of wolves, and wolves have access to domesticated animal carcasses and garbage dumps, 
Wolves can become habituated, that is, lose their fear of humans through scavenging behavior. A scenario where the two wolves became habituated by scavenging on human garbage and domesticated animal carcasses seems quite plausible in Finland. Highly suggestive evidence supporting this theory comes from a primary source I recently found. Professor A.J. Mella, a natural history scholar in Helsinki, published a book on Finnish wildlife in 1882 in the middle of the attacks. Mela seemed puzzled by the wolf's predatory behavior on children, noting correctly that the wolf, quote, rarely dares to come on humans. But when speaking specifically of the wolf population in southwestern Finland, he wrote, quote, the bear is no match for it, meaning the wolf, when it comes to scavenging, end quote. And that quote is by no means conclusive, but I think it is scavenging is a far more probable explanation of how and why habituation happens. Second, as even George Catlin had suggested back in 1841, the decline of wolves' wild and favored prey leads them to alternative sources of food. It's been very well established in the contemporary scientific literature on gray wolves that scarcity of wild prey leads to wolves changing to other prey, and it does lead to more attacks on domesticated livestock and domesticated pets. The favorite prey species of wolves in Finland, both then and now, is the moose. And there's clear evidence that the wolves who preyed on children also preyed on moose. In October 1881, when villagers found the body of an eight-year-old, they also found, quote, elk parts and some bones. Remember, elk is moose in Finland. Finish. Human hunting and loss of habitat in Finland severely impacted the moose population leading to the moose becoming a relatively rare species by 1900. Mela, the natural history professor I just wrote about, said that moose were already very rare in southwestern Finland in 1882. Clearly, the absence of moose motivated the wolves to look for new prey. There were also larger changes in the Finnish environment leading to habitat fragmentation and destruction for the moose population. So it's really fascinating. Historian Yoko Terpuri, who wrote about the wolf attacks, he's a Finnish historian, had a really interesting quote that after the wolf attacks, there was a kind of common folklore in the city of Porvo that the construction and completion of railways had banished the wolves from the place once and for all. And that's fascinating because it shows that the transformation of the Finnish environment was going on, construction and completion of railways, leading to habitat destruction and fragmentation, decline of the moose population, and thus the wolf attacks. <coughs> the final piece of the story comes with the size of the wolves and the size of the children. In the Iranian study, the authors noted that the wolves turned to garbage because shepherds were guarding domesticated livestock. The presence of adult human shepherds with firearms was enough to deter wolf attacks on sheep. But it's clear from the primary sources that parents were sending out young kids to tend cattle in the Finnish woods. The wolves were relatively large, clearly habituated to humans, that is, they lost their fear, and searching for food in a prey scarce environment. After the initial attack in 1878, 
And definitely by 1880, their search image changed from moose to children. An exhaustive study published in 2002 on all known gray wolf attacks on humans in world history indicated that in the extremely rare cases when non-rabbit wolves attack humans, children can be a target due to their size. In conclusion, the wolf attacks did not play a central role in the total eradication of the gray wolf population in Finland. There was nothing remotely similar in America, but just like Finland, wolves did not receive any special protection in national parks until the late 20th century. In both countries, eradication efforts went from the domain of amateurs farmers, and local bounties to systemized and highly effective eradication campaigns involving national governments. They also showed human-driven changes in the environment common to both countries at the end of the 19th century. Finally, a government powerful enough to create professionally administered national parks without pest animals, as Norton Schultz outlined in 1880. So he's talking about creating national parks in Finland in the middle of these attacks, and he's like, yeah, national parks are great as long as they don't have pests like wolves. And protect charismatic megafauna like the bison and the moose from extinction was also a government powerful enough to eradicate wolves. In 1880, same year that Norton Schultz proposed parks in Finland, same year as the attacks, Congress considered a bill introduced by Wyoming Territorial Delegate Stephen W. Downing to, quote, preserve, protect, and improve Yellowstone National Park after the large-scale slaughter of elk, deer, bighorn sheep, and bison in the region. Yellowstone, the world's first national park and an inspiration for Nordenschuld, did indeed become a haven for large herbivores. In 1883, just after the Finnish military and Russian hunters killed two wolves and just thus ended their predation on children, Secretary of the Interior Henry M. Teller in the United States banned hunting of all mammals except predators in Yellowstone. From a transnational or global perspective, national parks seem less like a uniquely American concept and more of a reaction to the severe effects on the environment from industrialization, a product of increased control over the environment, and linked to global ideas about nature that favored charismatic megafauna over apex predators. Governments strong enough to establish national parks and protect treasured species like the moose and the bison were also capable of eradicating the long-hated wolf. Thank you. Now, Jeff asked me to talk briefly about how this project fits into my research agenda, and that is this one and another one are tied directly to a Fulbright that I've been applying for. So the second project would involve working with a Finnish scholar named Dr. Ronnie Henrik Anderson at the University of Helsinki, exploring the links and comparisons between indigenous dispossession in Yellowstone and Finnish national parks in the northern part of Finland called Sotni. There's a large indigenous population in northern Finland called the Sotni. So what are your questions? Yeah. And did you have to learn Finnish to do this work? Or? I did. So I've been studying Finnish for the last year, 
And to be honest, that came after feedback from my first Fulbright application. I met with Ronnie over Zoom. He was in his cottage in the Finnish woods. And he was like, I think it would help your application to learn some Finnish. And I had been kind of tinkering with it on Duolingo. And then I started taking it more seriously. So I've been taking private lessons from a professor of Finnish. He was until recently at BYU called, named Aino Larsen. Now, to actually read 19th century Finnish, though, I rely on a translator app called DeepL that Alicia Carter recommended. And DeepL is a lot better than Google Translate, especially for the Finnish language. But even with DeepL, it helps tremendously to know some Finnish. Impressive. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I have a friend who looks at animals in Greek literature quite a bit. And yeah. he's talked about before that dogs are really interesting because they can be very loyal to humans, but they can also not be loyal to humans. Yeah. So there's a lot of anxiety about that. Is there similar, like, like, why is there such a target on wolves? Is it because there's an association with dogs that have been domesticated by humans? That's a really interesting question. So across the world, even including in indigenous societies, societies that have domesticated animals don't like wolves. Societies that, excuse me, that do have domesticated animals don't like wolves. Ones that don't are fine with them. So the Lakota in the United States did not have a problem with wolves at all. They relied on the bison, but that's not domesticated. The Sami in northern Finland actually don't like wolves because they're domesticated reindeer herders. And wolves prey on the domesticated reindeer. And the question does remind me that there was some discussion, even in the historiography of these attacks, that perhaps these were actually wolf-dog hybrids. And that's how they became habituated, but the consensus is that's not actually true. They were full-on great wolves. Now, they needed to become habituated to attack these humans, and that speaks to kind of what I was talking about, the reasons why they might have become habituated. Yes? So, I was surprised to hear that it wasn't immediately clear that it was wolves yep. uh, and that they were considered lynx, uh, maybe, uh, yep. attacks. Was there any kind of evidence of the remains that would have pointed one way or the other? I know forensic science at that point would not necessarily have been very advanced, but tooth marks or... So anything? when they tried to find the children that had been taken and eaten, a lot of people in Turku were convinced it was wolves. Government officials were not so sure. Some of them thought it was lynx. This elicited a lot of criticism of the government, particularly as the attacks continued. But it wasn't until early 1881 that officials in, in Turku said, no, this is absolutely wolves. This is not lynx. And if you notice here, um, they had bounties and targets on all predators. It wasn't just wolves. I'd say wolf was the most hated predator. But there is um, wolverine, which is Amoya, Katusha is foxes, Ilves Ilvexia is lynx, Susia is wolves, Kakuya is bears. And then they have otters and birds of prey, too. So there's bounties on all the predators, not just wolves. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious if you looked at all some of the uh, stories of lion predation in Africa, they were famous one year or the other, or things like that, because I don't know if it's any value or not, but just kind of interesting, some of the same kind of duos that. Yeah, the lions of Sava. I think habituation is definitely there, and the change of the search image is definitely there from the traditional prey to 
humans. I think the lions you saw were a bit different in that they were actually injured animals and they couldn't take down the bigger African prey and that's why they switched to humans. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think it was a response to prey scarcity and they're habituated and then parents are sending their eight-year-olds to go tend cattle in the woods. <laughs> Jeff, you got your hand up in the ball. Go ahead. Um, you caught me a bit thought. Sorry, uh, I saw your hand up. Uh, it seems the primary motivator for this wolf hunt was the children being killed. Mm -hmm. Were there in your readings opportunistic secondary impulses to go the 20 years or so you presented, such as the realtors who own that expanded Finland land or wolf fur or something along those lines? Yeah, I think my overall point is that in the Finnish secondary literature, these attacks were a big deal, right? And part of the story of wolf eradication. But when taken, for, and there's evidence for that, right? So you can look directly at the Finnish census, see a huge uptick in the amount of wolves killed during and in the four years after the attack, right? And even to this day, this is really big in Finnish culture, these attacks and motivating some resistance to wolf reintroduction in the country. So I do think there's evidence for that thesis. My argument is taken from a global context and a broader time frame, I don't actually think they're all that important. In the US, there's nothing remotely similar, and wolves are completely eradicated in the exact same time frame. And so I think the bigger story, right, is the transition from wolf hunting being, let's pass out a shotgun to a farmer, to this is a federal law, hiring wildlife biologists trained to do this systemized and highly effective. And that's a historical processes that's in both countries. And then it's also about control over the environment, right? So if you have a national government that's powerful enough to send in the army to protect bison and protect national parks, that government has the same power to go into these really remote areas of Finland and the US and kill all the wolves. <coughs> Yellowstone, they're part of it's the most remote area in the continental 48. Yeah? I'll, I'll ask, the, you kind of hinted at this a little bit already. Uh, what's the status of wolf conservation in Finland today? So, one reason why I'm so interested in Finland is there's all these parallels with the US. So, 18, excuse me, 1975, the bounty on wolves is finally removed as part of environmentalist movement in Finland, and it was an environmentalist movement in the U.S., right? Early 70s, you have the Nixon administration passing, the, creating the EPA, Endangered Species Act, and you have Earth Day. That led to, in Finland, the wolf being delisted from the bounty. Wolves then began to recolonize Finland from outside of Finland and from the north and repopulate. That caused and causes a lot of controversy. So in both the US and Finland, there's this myth out there, it doesn't have any basis in science, that the wolves doing the recolonization are somehow different and bigger and meaner than the native wolves. So you hear people in the West saying, well, the wolves reestablished in Yellowstone, they're Canadian wolves. And they're evil and they kill for fun. And that has no factual basis, right? It's not like the gray wolf population recognized a national boundary between Canada and the US. And in Finland, it's the same thing. They call them Russian wolves that are recolonizing. And of course, dovetailing with international politics. I hope you all can see where that's going. I do think there is a difference, though. You know, there was nothing remotely similar in the US. And this is a big story. When I was talking to Ronnie, 
he told me, even though I know better, and I know wolves are so beneficial for the environment, and that more people are killed by domesticated dogs and deer than wolves, I was back country skiing with my, you know, daughter, and we saw a wolf, and I immediately grabbed her. It was like I couldn't help myself. So I do think this story has a lot of resonance even today. All right, thank you, Dr. Dean. Thank you.